Martin for organizing this. Um, so, until recently, scholars primarily discussed Beauvoir, Beauvoir's work as a quaint relique in feminist theory. However, in the recent years, uh, people like Sonia Probst, Nancy Bauer, and others have argued for the importance of Beauvoir's contribution to political philosophy. Along these same lines, my goal in this paper is to show that there is a um, philosophical and political problem in the general idea of consent to submission, that an interesting and specific locus to examine this problem is the submission of women, and that Beauvoir's analysis of women's bodies provides a crucial way for resolving this problem without being caught in the traditional uh, structure versus agency dichotomy. So first I will argue that submission is a philosophical problem. I take submission in a broader sense than its uh, sexual connotation. I define submission as uh, the situation in which an agent B is dominated by an ag agent A, i.e. B is in an asymmetrical relationship with A, such that B performs whatever A, uh, a asks of her. In other words, submission is the way domination is lived by the dominated person. Submission differs from subordination because submission is a state resulting from subordination and carries the idea that this subordination is somewhat accepted. For instance, the subordination of women can be established through statistics that describe a state of the world, whereas the submission of women is a way to live the, their life that philosophy has to describe and analyze. Historically, philosophical accounts of domination, except for La Boétie's discourse of voluntary servitude, did not make a distinction between domination from the standpoint of the dominant and domination from the standpoint of the subordinate. But I think this distinction is crucial for giving a precise account of what domination is from the point of view of the dominated. Classical political philosophy did not argue that subordination did not exist or that submission did not exist. Uh, but it argued that it was against human nature and morally wrong to consent to submission, i.e. to be submissive. If men, before, because at that time only men were of concern, were born free and equal to one another, how could they possibly choose to alienate their freedom and give it to someone else? Here's the problem. Because of their pervasiveness of the basic assumptions of political liberalism, it's commonly believed that um, the submission of one individual to another individual is bad, and that the common goal in a liberal state should be to guarantee maximal freedom to all citizens. I take it that there is a paradox here between, on the one hand, this idea inherited from political philosophy, and on the other hand, the pervasiveness of submission in everyday life, be it through contract-based subordination, uh, where submission is apparently consented to, or submission in the name of feelings. Uh, and this paradox shows consent submission uh, as a philosophical problem. To study this paradox, I argue that the dynamics created by gender difference and patriarchy makes the submission of women a relevant locus of analysis. Claiming society is patriarchal is saying that there is a male domination based on the subordination of women. The most common understanding of this male domination is to see it as a vertical one-way relation of subordination or domination. Nonetheless, with the eventual inclusion of women in the polity, one might have imagined that women would also be incorporated in this horizontal group of citizens and then emancipated from masculine domination. But everyday statistics show that even with formal equality, women have remained more likely to be sub subordinated and maybe submissive, especially as wives submissive to their husbands. This permanence of strong social inequalities between men and women, despite the existence of formal equality, leads to wonder if somehow submission could seem alluring. For instance, the submission of women has been explained by some as based on a moral disposition of women, altruism, or on their feelings. It's supposedly women's love for their husbands and children that explains why women take up the care work for free in the family. So when you look at the patriarchal social organization, the enigma is what the American philosopher Ancott calls the endurance question. 
how does oppression endure over time in spite of humans' rough natural e equality? Should we think, since women in Western countries have gained formal equality with men and are legally recognized as full agents capable of consent, that they are consenting to their to this submission that perhaps it's not even submission because it's consented to because um, and that there may be a feminine essence maybe that makes them want to not be free or should we on the other side of the paradox consider that there are historical social economic structures that are such that women are pure victims of male domination and cannot consent in the way normal agents are supposed to because they're too internally colonized by male domination. These are roughly the two ends of the explanatory spectrum of female submission provided by feminist philosophy from liberal feminists to the radical approaches of, for instance, McKinnon and Dworkin. But I take it that none of these approaches give a satisfactory and full explanation of the phenomenon and that Beauvoir's philosophy, and more specifically her analysis of women's bodies, is useful to provide a more subtle take. In the second sex, Beauvoir gives a complex analysis of female bodies based on a phenomenological method and on an existentialist conceptual frame. I take it that this approach resulting in this composition enables Beauvoir to show through the way female bodies are both lived and perceived what female submission is, first, why women would consent to this submission, and finally, how to possibly build an emancipatory path out of it. So, um, first, I want to show that women's bodies are at the core uh, of Beauvoir's enterprise in the second sex. To understand what Beauvoir does in the introduction of the second sex, I take it that um, Nancy Bauer's interpretation of it being a feminine or a feminist reappropriation of Descartes' meditations is particularly convincing. In the second meditation, Descartes wonders what kind of existing thing he is. At that point, he relies on evidence and clear and distinct ideas to state the obvious. He's a man, i.e. a human being. Then he builds the following reasoning. Because he can doubt his body exists, but he cannot doubt he himself exists, then the body cannot be an essential component of what, of what a human being is. Beauvoir opens the second sex with an autobiographical justification for its writing. She explains that she wanted to write her autobiography and that the first way um, that when she, she tried to define herself, her first answer, the answer she feels she must give first, is that she is a woman. And it is very clear that this comes from the fact that, on the contrary of Descartes, she cannot ignore her body. If both men and women have a body, what seems to be a crucial dimension of sexual difference is that only women are bodies. A lot has been said about Beauvoir's philosophical influences, sometimes as a way to dismiss uh, the possibility of her having an original philosophical thought. I want to argue here that she does rely on a conception of the body inherited from the phenomenological tradition, but that she gives an, an original analysis of the specificity of women's bodies. In a way, there are three dimensions um, of the body in the second sex. First, the woman's body is conceived as an object by the male gaze. Second, the same objectified body is at the same time ex an experienced and lived body. And in this regard, she's deeply influenced by Mère Le Ponty's account of the lived body. But the true originality of Beauvoir's account and the, the crucial uh, thesis in my understanding of the second sex is the third level. The woman's body is a body lived as objectified, as an objectified body. Beauvoir asserts in Ethics of Ambiguity that the body itself is not a brute fact. It expresses our relationship to the world. Women, because they live a body that is constant, constantly constructed by the, the exterior world as an object, have a very specific relationship to the world. 
one could object that Sartre, for instance, in being and nothingness, insists on how our body is constantly made an object for, by people in front of us. But in Sartre's perspective, we are constantly fighting to establish that our position, the subject position, is the right position about ourselves. Women are not in the same situation because they are constantly constituted as the other with a capital O, i.e. the body that remains an object, whatever happens. Beauvoir thus writes in the introduction, why is it that women do not dispute male sovereignty? No subject will really readily volunteer to become the object, the inessential. It is not the other who, in defining himself as the other, establishes the one. So here she distances from, uh, Hegelian, from the Hegelian perspective to understand sexual difference. But if the other is not to regain the status of being the one, he must be submissive enough to accept this alien point of view. Whence comes this submission in the case of women? So we see here how this objectification conceived as an alienation is intrinsically related for Beauvoir with what female submission is. But she goes further than the simple object-subject distinction. Understanding what a woman is means understanding what it is to live in the first person, a body pr primarily constructed as an object. There she relies on a phenomenological conception of the body inherited from Husserl and Merleau-Ponty. As Husserl says, there are different ways to approach the body as a thing or as a lived experience. From there, Merleau-Ponty says in the phenomenology of perception, the body is our general medium for having a world. What Beauvoir retains from this is the necessity to abolish the traditional Descartes inherited opposition between the subject and the object. She, um, as some of you may know, she uh, did the first review of uh, the phenomenology of perception in Les Temps Modernes uh, when it was released, and she says, one of the great merits of phenomenology is in its abolishing of the opposition between the subject and the object. It is impossible to define an object apart from the subject by whom and for whom it is the object. And the subject reveals itself only in, the, in relation to the objects that it is, it is engaged with. So Beauvoir clearly endorses this conception of the lived body in, her, in the second sex. She says, for instance, in the perspective I am adopting, that of Heidegger, Sartre, and Merleau-Ponty, if the body is not a thing, it is a situation. It is our grasp upon the world and the outline of our projects. And she, so it's page 73 of the second sex. And then she says, it is not the body object described by a bio biologist that actually exists, but the living body of the subject, or a lived body, the corps vécu. But where she parts way with Merleau-Ponty is in, is in analyzing women's embodied situation. What the introduction announces and what the book is all about in a way is to show the ambiguity of women's embodied situation. Women are constituted by the male gaze as objects through their bodies and they are constantly stuck between claiming their subjectivity and seeing them defined as objects. This is why Sarah Enama writes, um, Le deuxième sexe is not a thesis about women's socialization, but a phenomenological inquiry into the constitution of the meaning of sexual difference. And we could say that the meaning of sexual difference is precisely the fact that men can have bodies where women are bodies. The origin of this ambiguity of women's embodied situation is explained by Beauvoir in the first pages of the second volume. Beauvoir shows that sexual difference is created by the alienation of little girls' bodies and that the difference between boys and girls lies in the fact girls are raised to conceive themselves as objects, as passive objects, when boys are encouraged to throw themselves into the world. But this ambiguity is even more clearly stressed by the organization of the book itself. The first volume shows how the female is constituted as an object, not only in the sense that they are the, uh, this irreducible other, but also in the sense that women are constituted as animals belonging to the imminent world. In that regard, I take it that the first chapter, biology, that a lot of people conceived as 
Beauvoir being uh, biologic, um, uh, endorsing biological determinism, which I completely um, disagree with, aims, on the contrary, to show that women are conceived as belonging to imminence when men have the possibility of aiming for a transcendence and that this imminence transcendence position replays and reinforces the object-subject one. More broadly, the various forms of objectification of women through the male gaze is the topic of the first volume. At the end of the first book, it is clear that women are defined through their bodies are as things or objects. The second volume aims to embrace the question, what is a woman, from the woman's perspective. There, the affinity with Merleau-Ponty becomes obvious. This whole volume is about the lived experience of women, which is a lived experience of their lived body. In, in that part, what is a woman is, how, what, how does it feel like to have a woman's body? A uh, woman's body. The central claim of that part is that understanding what a woman is means understanding what it is to live in the first person as a subject, as a body primarily constructed as an object. I take it that there is a fundamental intertwining between the body studied as a thing and as a lived experience and phenomenology as a method to study it. The crucial importance of the body of women both as an object and as the situation of women as subjects, is what makes Beauvoir adopt a phenomenological method, and that this method is what opens the possibility of an analysis of female submission. So submission, as I said earlier, earlier is the way domination is lived by the dominated person. Giving an account of female submission hence requires to adopt the standpoint of the subordinated person, which is a standpoint that is silenced by the very dynamics of domination. The traditional analysis of domination avoids the pr this problem in picturing domination as a one-way vertical relationship that only needs to be analyzed from the top. Understanding the logic of submission and the possibility to consent of consenting to it requires to reverse the analysis and switch from the usual top-down to a bottom-up perspective. However, Providing a bottom-up account of the experience of silenced people is a methodological conundrum. I take it that Beauvoir finds a way through this conundrum with her use of phenomenology. The problem is, of course, not stated in those terms in Beauvoir's time, but is in an existentialist vocabulary of essence versus existence dichotomy. The first volume is dedicated to responding to the question, what is a woman from the usual standpoint? Um, the male standpoint, but the second volume is a complete change of perspective and standpoint to um, finally understand how it feels to have a female body. This phenomenological approach, based on the idea that the question of essence is better answered by description than by a simple definition, is a relevant method to understand what submission is in the sense of how submission is lived. This methodological take leads Beauvoir to a description of women's lived experiences in their different features and through them of what female submission is. For every human being, the body is, according to Beauvoir, a situation. Nonetheless, understanding the specificity of the female situation is to understand how women's experiences are shaped by the fact that they are caught between this objectifying gaze and the subjectivity. In giving a phenomenological account of this, Beauvoir gives a phenomenological account of the various, various forms female submission can take. As I said earlier, if there is a methodological conundrum in understanding submission, there seems to be an impossibility in the idea of a consent submission. Sounds like only an idea very misogynistic people would use. I want to show here that I think Beauvoir's insistence on the lived experiences of women enable to understand how this consent to submission work and how it's not um, how talking about consent to submission doesn't make women completely responsible for their submission, nor um, make it just uh, false consciousness on their part. So that she, my my idea is that she really finds a, a middle way to explain this as an ambiguous situation that can be countered, but that still exists. 
Um, I thus take it that her phenomenological method enables her to depict the pleasures uh, created by objectification, and especially physical objectification. One striking feature of Beauvoir's description of women's lived experience is that women, whatever the situation they are depicted in, seem to get something out of their submission. Maybe the housewife is caught up in bad faith when she tells herself stories about being the queen of the kingdom that her house is. But there is also the real pleasure of being the, the queen of this kingdom. And when she, and, and Beauvoir gives very interesting uh, descriptions of, of this pleasure and the pleasure of the, the housewife that makes the chicken and the potatoes and she makes this joke where she says at a point we don't know if the potatoes are from, for the husband or if the husband is for the po potatoes um, because she really takes pleasure in this masterpiece that cooking uh, is. In the second and third chapter of the second part devoted to the girl and the sexual initiation Beauvoir analyzes the constitution of, the, of female eroticism and show how it is structured by a desire to be sexually objectified that she, on several occasions, called the delights of passivity. The heart of feminine eroticism is built on a structure of submission object passivity. For instance, Beauvoir explains, I'm quoting, the feminine love is one of the forms of experience in which a conscience objectifies itself for a being that transcends it. Or that, I'm quoting again, the little girl learns that by consenting to the deepest abdications, she will become all-powerful. She basks in a masochism that prom promise her crowning conquests. So here we see the ambiguity between submission, but the pleasures and, and the rewards of submission. There is a vivid difference between the eroticism of boys based on the image of chasing prey, and that of girls, which is founded on the allure of waiting and passivity. She was doing nothing but dreaming her future passivity, she writes, for instance, in the first paragraph of the chapter on the girl. This allure of self-objectification, as Nancy Bauer says, and passivity in the girl, and later in the grown woman, is explained by Beauvoir to an existentialist conceptual frame, modified by a quite Marxist approach of the concept of submission, but in any case, it paves the way to think the possibility um, of consent submission. Articulating an existentialist conceptual frame to this phenomenological depiction, she resolves what can be seen as the paradox of consent submission in showing that consenting to submission is not an active movement to renounce freedom. It is just a passive non-involvement in the painful movement that freedom is. The Beauvoirian concept of freedom as transcendence builds a series of conceptual couples, subject, object, transcendence, immanence, activity, passivity, and shows how risky and uncertain freedom is. Freedom is not something that is given to the subject. As she first explained in an abstract manner in Pierce and Cineas, uh, published in 1944, freedom is not static. It expresses itself through projects and its transcendence, and it is transcendence in the sense that it consists in moving towards indetermination. Consequently, freedom is risky. It's, it requires the courage and confidence to determine a project for oneself and to throw oneself into an undetermined world. So there is a cost to freedom due to its riskiness, which can cause a desire to retreat to what uh, Beauvoir explains in Ethics of Ambiguity as being the child situation, where obedience and dependence were the price to pay for avoiding the existential anguish, anguish of freedom. The crucial aspect of this theory of freedom and of the phenomenological method underlying it is that not only does it give a credible explanation of the will women can have towards submission, but it even dissolves the apparent antinomy of consent submission. In political theory, the problem of consent submission is based on the fact that freedom is seen as a right humans are born with. As a result, submission can only spring from an alienation of freedom, and no rational mind should want to be alienated from this freedom, so no rational minds should consent submission. But if freedom is not a right humans are born endowed with, 
if freedom is a costly movement in the way Beauvoir depicts it, then there is no more contradiction in the idea of consenting submission. Consenting submission is not an active movement to renounce freedom, it is just a passive non-involvement in the painful movement that freedom is. But explaining female submission with this one-dimensional approach would seem to refute the specificity of female submission. All human beings are likely to try to avoid existential anguish through bad faith, and submission is just a form of bad faith. So um, I think that Beauvoir shows that women are more likely to be submissive than men because of their situation. The concept of situation is meant to account for the fact that any existential subject unavoidably lives her singularity within social conditions. Beauvoir's desire to avoid a solipsistic view of existentialism and phenomenology leads her to give as much importance to economic and social structures as to existential anguish or hypothetical asocial consciousness. If women are more likely to take pleasure in objectification, it is because of a phenomenological dilemma that concerns all human beings, but that affects women more deeply because of their situation. So um, the, the, situation, the economic and social situation of women make them structurally more likely to accept this, this, this uh, submission and to, to go for this bad faith that is not exactly a bad faith in the Sartrean sense because it's an excusable bad faith. It's a, it's a bad faith that, has, um, uh, that is create by the, created by the social structure. So in a way, um, we can see that she gives an account for... Um, she, she, she finds a way between the, in, in, in this dichotomy between agency and structure because the, the concept of situation accounts for the structural part but there is still the agency of the woman that can still decide given the situation of a certain, of a certain ways to um, fight this subordination or this submission and it's interesting that in Ethics of Ambiguity, she explains that, of course, um, a slave in the 18th century or a, a woman in a harem can't be accused of, um, not, of being in bad faith because the structural conditions are so strong. But the moment where the problem of consent submission can really appear is when there is this formal equality that makes the situation not a too um, heavy structure in a way, and then enables the, the agency to happen, even if it's a, a, an agency that is, um, that is structured by society. So um, to conclude, I want to stress the fact that Beauvoir's understanding of the body as a situation, and of the situation as a historically, socially, and economically determined, as history socially and economically determined leaves the possibility of emancipation open. And um, so, I, I, for instance, I want to quote um, this, this part of uh, page 75 of the first volume, where she says, a man is defined as a being who is not given, who makes himself what he is. As Merleau-Ponty very justly puts it, man is not a natural spe species, he is a historical idea. Woman is not a fixed reality, but rather a becoming, and it is in her becoming that she should be compared with a man. That is so say that it's so say that her possibilities should be defined. So here we can see that um, what Beauvoir does is to fight the fixist um, apprehension of women to see that there is a possibility of emancipation and that. The, the fact that the situation of women lead them to consent submission is not, has to be historicized in a way. Thank you.